you're so good. I'm so grateful to be in this place tonight to have the chance to worship you, to have the chance to come and to lift my hands and give you glory because you are so deserving, God. As we open up this service tonight, I want to welcome you to our youth service for the month of November. And uh, the month of Thanksgiving, and I'm just grateful and thankful to be in this place tonight. Aren't you grateful to be in the house of the Lord, to worship him, to give him glory and honor? Just thankful for our pastors, brother and sister Olson, that give us this opportunity. We're so blessed to have an opportunity to be used in ministry and to have this opportunity to allow God to speak through us and to use us to anoint us to be used in his kingdom. And as we open up this service, let's just lift our hands and give God a, this atmosphere of praise. Let's lift up an atmosphere of praise. Let's give God glory. Let's give him honor. Let's give him all the worship that's due into his name because he's so glorious. He's died on the cross for our sins. His blood was shed for us that we could have a second chance of life, that we wouldn't face death in eternity, God. Thank you, God, for that blood that was shed on the cross. God, we worship you. We praise you, God. And as we go before you tonight, God, we're just going to lift you up and we're going to give you all the glory due to your name because you're so mighty and you're so excellent and you're so great, God. Worship with us as we sing about our mighty God tonight.
voice of triumph. He's the great Jehovah. He's the great I am. Come on, church. Somebody sing hallelujah. Does anybody just want the more of God in this place? More than anything else, we want his Holy Spirit to reign in our, in our country, in our lives, in our cities, in our schools. We want him to take over, right? Come on, church. We want him to take over. We want his spirit to take over and reign all over this place, all over our nation. We need his spirit to take over our nation. More than anything else, we don't need a president. We don't need anything. But we need Jesus. We don't need a government. We need Jesus. We don't need politics. We need Jesus. We worship with us as we sing.
last time, sing we want more and say. Come on, can we just say that tonight? God, I want more of you tonight, Jesus. God, let me set aside the distractions that are in my mind right now, the things I'm thinking about. I know it's a Wednesday night, church. I know it's a midweek service. There's a lot on our plates. There's a lot on our minds. We're tired. We're worn out. But God, can, can we just worship him tonight? Can we just take a second to step aside and say, tonight is all about you, God. You know, a matter of fact, just this next hour is all about you, God. Let me just take a second and step out of my pride, step out of my selfishness and say, God, this next hour is for you, God. I'm going to set aside my distractions, God. I'm going to set aside what's going on in my mind, and I'm going to focus on you, God. God, give us a word tonight through these young people, God. Speak to us like never before through these young people, God. Let this be all about you, God, because you are so worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. As we go before the Lord in prayer tonight, we do have a few prayer requests. As always, let's lift up our pastors, brother and sister Olson, in prayer. They could always use our prayers for strength. Let's pray for Sister Janet Mitchell, God, and just lift her up. She's in severe pain, and she just needs a touch from the Lord. Touch uh, Sister Sally and Brother Dave. They need a healing tonight. And then we also have a Brother Alan DeWeese. He's in extreme um, pain, and he needs a, a touch from the Lord as well tonight. Who in this building has a need tonight? If you could signify it by the lifting of your hand. I know a God that can meet every need. I know a healer. I know a deliverer. I know a God that can meet you where you are tonight. If you just lift those hands one more time as we go before him in prayer. God, you see these needs in this house tonight, God. You see the pain that people are going through. You see the stress that people have in their minds, God. You see the financial burden that people are going through, God. But tonight we give it all to you, Jesus. We lay it at your feet, God. We give you every need and every problem because you are a problem solver, God. You are a sovereign God that looks after his people. That will always look after his righteous. His righteous will never go hungry. They will never be seen begging bread. He will take care of you in your time of need, in your time of pain. God, touch our pastors tonight. God, give them strength and encouragement. Touch every need in this building, God. And God, I ask you to allow this service, God. We rebuke any distractions. We rebuke any spirits of fear, God. We ask that you allow these young people to speak with boldness, God. Let your anointing fall on them, God. Let them speak a word into our life, God. Let us receive the word, God. And I ask that you open up our hearts, open up our minds, God. Let us receive the word. Let us have understanding of the word that we're receiving tonight, God. Speak to us through these young people tonight, God. Let your spirit move in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, God. You're so worthy. We're going to go and have some announcements. You're welcome to be seated. And uh, our announcement speaker, Sister Anna. Hey, good evening, everyone. All right, so for our announcements today, um, this Friday we are having Next Level here on the COP campus. Please see Brother Mike Jones and Sister Gerilis Jones for some info about that. Uh, the details will be posted on social media via Instagram and Facebook, so make sure to check that out. 
Next level parents and hyphen, please remember HYC's fees as due dates are very close. If you have any questions about HYC, please contact a youth team member. And also, Pastor Olson's birthday is coming up. Yay, woo! <laughs> um, so because of that, you still have some time to get your gifts and funny cards ready to bless our amazing pastor. Thank you. Good evening, church. May the ushers please come forward. I'm going to pray over the offering. God, I want to pray that you bless the offering, God, and that you bless those who are giving and those who are not giving, God. In Jesus' name, amen.
friend of God. I'm so grateful for God and everything he's done in our life. Hallelujah, church. Are you ready to see what these young people are going to bring to us tonight? I'm excited. I'm so ready to hear what God has spoken into their lives. And I know they're going to be anointed. For our fiery five tonight, we're going to have this, um, this young lady. I'm so proud of where God's taken her and how God's moved in her life and helped her grow. She's grown spiritually. And I'm just excited to hear what God's going to speak through her. If we can invite Kaylin Erkin to the, to the pulpit for our fiery five speaker tonight. And church, let's get behind her. She's going to do an amazing job. Good evening, church. Before I begin, I would like to give thanks to both my pastors, brother and sister Olson, and my youth pastors for allowing me to have the opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. So the scriptures I will be reading from are Daniel chapter 6, verses 5 through 10. And it says, finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man. Daniel, unless it is something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and satraps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, perfect satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edit, edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human during being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty issue the decree and put it in the writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repelled. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to the upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God just as he had done before. You may be seated. So, King Darius was tricked by his advisors to make a decree that said, if you pray to any other god or king beside King Darius, you would be giving a death punishment and be thrown into a den of lions. And Daniel was fully aware of this, but instead, he showed no hesitation and continued to pray God, pray to God. Daniel knew the punishment, but he had so much faith in God that God would do the right thing that he still prayed with his window open. But if you look deeply into the scripture, it said that he didn't just pray. He went to his room three times and got down on his knees and gave thanks. So basically... His last prayer, because this was a death sentence, he didn't ask God, please save me, please have mercy on me. He had enough faith in God that he gave thanks to God and knew that God would always keep him safe. And the reason why that is so important is because sometimes we have a relationship with God where we only come to him when we need something from him. And if we have a relationship with God, we'll never be able to do what Daniel did just come out of a den of lions without a scratch. Daniel's relationship with God, one man who had a relationship with God, got, in, got a king to make a decree that his entire kingdom had to worship that God. And we can do the exact same thing that Daniel did. For example, I love compliments. I feel like compliments are the best thing you could receive because, and I know it sounds shallow, but they make you feel good about yourself. But the best type of compliments are the compliments you receive about your actions. The compliments that are like, you are the nicest person I've ever met. How could you be so nice? Or you are so positive all the time. How could you be so happy? Those are the best type of compliments because they allow you to tell people about God's glory. And, and Daniel was faithful to God. He trusted and obeyed God, and obeyed God, and God gave him strength. So anything that is good, that people see in us, comes from God. 
And that's what others need to see in us. We need to be that role model. If you want God to do something in your life, you're going to need a part of you that trusts and obeys God, just like Daniel. We need to be able to thank God for his goodness, and so others can see that goodness in us. But it's really easy to be able to thank God when everything's going your way. But it's not easy to thank God when you're going through really tough times. Or it could just be times when you're overloaded with stress by the work you have, or maybe you have family issues, or you're being, you're being bullied because you're, you're, you don't fit in, you know? You're different. You believe in different things other people do. But I found that there's lots of things that could strengthen your trust in God that'll be able to give you the relationship that Daniel had with God. Sometimes just coming to church, being surrounded by the people who love God just as much as you, and who go through troubles just like you, that helps me a lot. It really helps to be able to strengthen your faith because it just makes you love God even more. Sometimes just reading the Bible. Reading the Bible, you get to see all the amazing things that God's done, and that just makes you want to jump up and be like, God gave me this breath. I couldn't have had this breath, but he gave it to me. I'm so proud, and I'm so thankful that I love God, and I have him in my life. And God is so good to us, and we need to be able to have that relationship that Daniel had with God. And we can, by just giving, him, by just giving God our highest praise. I hope I've encouraged you tonight, church. Thank you for listening. Amen. That was so encouraging. Thank you, Sister Kaylin. And for our, uh, our main portion of the service, we have a few speakers tonight that are uh, men and women of God. And I'm so proud of where God is going to take them over the course of their life. And if they keep letting God use them at the age they are, they're going to grow into such mighty ministers of God. For our, our keynote speakers, we're going to have Nathaniel Quinones. He's number one. Followed by Sister Hannah Smith. And then to finish us off, we're going to have Brother Samuel Joseph. He's going to finish off and bring us home. And uh, they're just going to come up here. And whenever each one of them finish, they're going to follow right after them. And uh, they're just going to have their liberty in the spirit tonight and be used by the anointing power of the Holy Ghost to speak to us what God wants us to hear tonight. So if Brother Nathaniel can come forward and start us off tonight. Awesome, you're gonna have awesome. Praise the Lord, church. I just wanna thank God for this opportunity. Uh, I wanna give honor to my youth pastors, uh, Brother Evan and Sister Kimberly, and our church pastors, brother and sister Olson for giving me this opportunity to speak. I also want to honor my parents for giving me a life full of support and love, and I thank them for all they've done for me. <clears throat> I consider this matter that I'm going to speak on with the utmost earnestness, and I do not take this opportunity lightly. Today I will be speaking on two words, but God. I believe these two words could move mountains, open seas, break chains, and make devils tremble. That word tremble means to shake invulnerably, typically as a result of anxiety, excitement, or frailty. Frailty means weakness. So what this definition is saying is that devils shake with weakness at the mention of God. If we could turn to Philippians 2.10. Well, we all know that Jesus is God, so we could continue, or so we could switch those words. <clears throat> that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and uh, things under the earth. What this verse is trying to say is that that the mention of God is not the mention of God's name is not only for the human life, but like I already mentioned, the things unseen, like angels, devils, and anything else in the earth. 
So before I read Mark 4, I just wanted to give some background information. Oh, so what happens is that Jesus just finished preaching the parable of the sower that's going to sow, that was going to sow on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And he told the disciples that they needed to go across the sea. So in Mark 4, 36 through 41, it says, And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was not full. And he was in the hinder part of the, hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? I just want to stop right here really quickly and say that this is everyone who is bound by fear and limit God in their lives. Continuing the story in the verse 39, And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceeding, saying one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and sea obey him? I want to say to you today, do not fear the Lord, do not fear what the Lord has for you. You might be in a storm today, but just know that if you call on the master, and if you call on the master, he will stoop down and give you a peace greater because of that testimony, and knowing the power of his name. That storm might bring you down, just remember, but God. Now, I want to talk to you about Moses. If we could turn to Exodus 4, 10 through 11. And Moses said unto the Lord, O oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant. But I am slow of speech, and slow, and slow, and slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? This just shows that whatever time, whatever time you think you're unqualified for your calling, just remember that nothing can qualify you but God. Even if you're blind, mute, deaf, or slow of speech, as the Lord mentioned, he made you that way for a reason, to show others that if you can answer the call, they can too. If we can read Exodus 14, 11 through 14, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt th thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it has been, for it has been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he should he will shew to you today. For the Egyptians who, have, who ye have seen today, ye shall never again no more for, see them no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall, and ye shall hold your peace. These verses are recorded for us, to sh for us to show there will always be those who doubt the Lord and just stay, want to stay in their situation because they're comfortable. And what Moses said was just astounding considering the situation he was in between the faithless Israelites and their impending doom. He said that the Lord will fight for you and that his salvation will be shown. <clears throat> because they were people of God, even if they didn't have faith, they could have been enslaved by fear or chains, but God. Less, <clears throat> last but not least, Gideon. To give you background information, Gideon was called upon to save the people of Israel by leading them against the Midianites. In a common theme of apostasy, the people of Israel had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of the Midian. The Midianites were, captured, were capturing any crops produced by the Israelites, giving them grief. When the people of Israel realized the error of their ways and cried, for, cried out for help to the Lord, a prophet was sent to deliver them as they had been rescued from Egypt. In Judges 6, 12 through 16, and the angels of the Lord appeared unto them and said unto them, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be his miracles which our father told, of us, told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. 
And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this might, and thou shalt save Israel from the land of the Midianites. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. This is another example of how God could use how God can use someone that's not popular or great, even when you are fearful like Gideon, always trust in Christ, not only because of what he has done before, but also what he can do right now. Yeah. <clears throat> know this, God. Know this. God is not a sign of goodness. Goodness is a sign of God. Gideon could have been drowned by fear and unbelief, but God. To finish this off, I'm just going to read James 4, 1 through 6. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Yet you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss. That you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that the friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says it in vain? The spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Or to say it in a different way, he gives greater grace. You may say, but I was abused. He's got greater grace. You can say, but I was misused, but he gives greater grace. You can say, but you don't understand. I've been addicted for years. Yeah, but think of all the years of your addiction. Add them together, and the verse still says, he gives greater grace. <clears throat> Same were some of you, but God. church. First off, I would love to give honor to my pastors and my youth pastors and youth team. And always I want to give honor to my parents and my brother and his growing family. They support me very much. If you would stand for the reading of the word. We will be reading from Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. KJV. If there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one cord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but, all, but every man also on the things of others. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and found himself in the fashion as well. Found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became a servant unto death, even the death of the cross. You may be seated. Daniel Webster, when asked, what was the greatest thought that had entered his mind, replied, my accountability to Almighty God. Tonight, I would like to speak to you on our accountability to our Almighty God. I am in awe that the God I serve found himself in the fashion as a man and humbled himself so that you and I could have the opportunity if we choose to live 
and serve him and live in his presence forever. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. What did Paul ask the saints at Philippi? Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Okay, JV. In this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense to the day of Christ. In verse 11, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. O oh Lord, I pray, give us the fruits of righteousness that we may glorify you. Myself and my youth group heard a message during NAYC that I want to make sure takes root in my heart. It was just a shock. She spoke on what is righteousness. When the Bible speaks on breaking bread, it was not a time of just casually eating together. It was a time of entering covenant relationship with each other. That means, my brother, my sister, I will not lie on you. I will not cheat on you. I will not claw my way over you just to be seen. Or let's bring it down to where we live. I will not talk about you when you exit a room. I will not make jokes at your expense. And I will not intentionally hurt you. You are my brother. You are my sister. We are breaking bread. We are entering covenant relationship with each other. I will prefer you. I will seek to understand you. When we get true revelation of humility and what it looks like in action, that is humbling within itself. (laughs) We have many examples throughout the Bible of humility. In our text, God, our greatest example came down to earth as a man and lived among us or the people and he just with the mission to die on the cross at the hands of those who betrayed him just so if we choose we can live in his presence forever and ever now we know that in his flesh God did not want to go on the cross Come on, would you? I wouldn't. Um, But through prayer, he submitted his will. He submitted, God, your will be done. Humility will lead us to obedience when we get our flesh under control. We realize it's not about me. What's in it for me? How many followers do I have? How many likes do I have? How many self-care days do I get? I have a right to blah, blah, blah. Our elders sometimes fear that our generation is shallow and carnal. But I just want to prove them now. I don't mean I want to rebuke our elders. Mom, I promise I'm not doing that. I just want to, like, you know, get some reassurance that we are going to carry this truth and obey this word that we have hidden in our hearts until the Lord returns. To my generation, I want to be found righteous. But if we make this life all about us individually, if we make this life about all of us individually and live to our flesh, oh, brother, we are correctly being labeled by the fruits that they see. I want to be accountable to my almighty God. I want to humility to lead me to obey scripture like James chapter 1 verses 22. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Like Philippians chapter 2 verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not only in my, pre- not in my presence only, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Like John chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you. That ye love one another as I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If ye have love one to another. Our obedience of scripture will lead us to love as God intended. You can't do this well in your flesh. Jesus could not have gone to the cross in his flesh alone. He had to submit his flesh, meaning his will, to God's will. As we submit, meaning obey, God teaches us that this is greater than us individually. It it teaches us that it's not about 
us, but it's about God. It's about the Father's business. It's about seeking first the kingdom of God. It's about loving Him. It's about loving others, loving God with our whole heart, and not ever thinking that I or anyone is better than anyone just because they have been blessed to know Jesus' goodness and mercy their whole life. I love God, and I want to give back and love what he loves. I feel responsible to be accountable to our almighty God. And in conclusion, we are accountable. We must work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. So let's seek first to understand true humility and righteousness. Then humility lead us to a heart eager and willing to obey and submit to all scripture and let obedience lead us to a place where we love scripture like Matthew chapter 22 verses 37 through 40. Jesus said unto them, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest com great commandment. <laughs> the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So I propose to us, it is our reasonable service as Christians to do things that he has instructed us. Let us be accountable for our relationship with our almighty God. God bless you. <laughs> How y'all doing? Sorry, give me a second. Oops. Good evening. Whoa. No, 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 no. I didn't come to first period at school. I came to church at Pentecost, and I've been going here for quite a while, so I know that when I say good evening, y'all can give me a good evening. I'm asking you right now, can we turn some applause to Jesus? Can we give some grace? Can we give some power? Can we give, can we give some glory to God? Because somebody in this house better have a reason to dance. Somebody in this house better have a reason to sing. I don't know what he did for you, but what he did for me was pick me up when I was at my lowest. So I'm asking you one more time, can you give some glory to God? Can you give some glory to God? Come on, brother. Come on, sister. Don't get tired now. Amen, amen, amen. All right, um, so I just want to let you all know that I'm not going to be preaching tonight. I'm not going to be preaching. I know that sounds confusing. What I am trying to say is that God's going to be preaching through me. It's not going to be of me. It's not going to be for me. It's not going to be anything about me. I know that he's given me a word. I know he wants to use me as his vessel. But in order for that to happen, I'm just going to get out of the way and allow him to do what he came to do. And before, and at, before I begin, I'm just going to pray real quick, and I ask that you all would pray with me. And y'all will pray for me that God would just pour into me and just allow it burn his fire in my heart. Father God, we come before you today, Lord, worshiping you. We praise you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you, God, that you are holy. We thank you, God, that you are righteous. Lord, I thank you that every single person in this house today has been placed in this house for a reason. Every single person in this house today is here because you have destined for them to be here. And Lord, I ask that I would just completely leave and that you would surge in. I pray that you would give me understanding. I pray that you would give me wisdom, and I pray that you would pour into me. Jesus, I give you everything that I have today, and I pray that you would take complete control of my tongues. Thank you, Lord. We love you. We worship you, and we pray that you would do a mighty work here, and we thank you for the work that you've already done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So tonight we are going to be reading, well, I'm going to be reading, from Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16. I'll let you all get that for a second. Here we go. All right, verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put light, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and, it's, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your father in heaven. Tonight, I'm gonna be preaching on this topic called hidden light. You may be seated. So I think a lot of us were growing up on the song from this verse. It's called This Little Light of Mine. And uh, if you don't know what this song is, you're probably living under a rock. But it's, um, it just repeats over and over and over again. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And it just says that 
uh, repeated, re- repeatedly. And when Jesus talks about this, uh, this parable with the person and the lamp, I, I don't know why, I don't know if about y'all, but I always picture some, a person with a bowl and they have like a little candle in it or something and then they have, another can- they have another bowl on top of it and they're just walking around with the bowl, but they're never letting their light be shown. But then all of a sudden, when there's another room with, with more light, then they open up the bowl, right? And the, the biggest thing about what I, when I picture this is that the person, when they enter into darkness and when they see darkness, they stay away from that or they never let their light be shown to that. And then I, always, I just read about this and I'm like, the, the person's hiding their bowl under, a, their, the person's hiding their light under a bushel? That's crazy, that's insane. And a lot of us, we, we, when we read this, we, we think the exact same thing. And then I feel the Holy Spirit, y'all know how the Holy, Spirit's convic- Holy Spirit convicts you sometimes. He was like, Sam, that's you. Every, when, you go, when you go to school, when you go into places of darkness, you hide my light from people. And I think, I think the funniest thing is that a lot of times we have the spirit at our disposal. We have the spirit right within our heart. We have him living inside of us. But too often, and I think so often, we allow, we, we hold him back. We keep him in a lockbox, as, as I would like to say. And, and please don't misunderstand me. The Holy Spirit gives us the ability to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit gives us the tingle. He gives us the great fire of revival, but his purpose doesn't end there. And church, why are we allowed his purpose to end there? We come to church and we say, we come to church, a place of the light, and we have this hunger. We say, God, we want every bit of the spirit that we can get. We want every bit of your anointing that we can possibly have. But then when we go to the place without light, when we go to the place without the anointing, we hold back. Why? And I think the church today and today, our church, right now, we are so quick to separate from darkness that we forget that we have a place in darkness too. Hold, hold on, just hold on, hold on, hold on. Our nature is supposed to be separate from darkness. We live in a day and age where good is called evil and evil is called good. But you have to understand that we are the destroyers of darkness. We're not the people who are supposed to stay out of the trenches. No, 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 we're the people that are supposed to go in the trenches and sow the seed. And the, so my question to you today is why are we running away from the things we're supposed to change? Why are we being small over the things we're supposed to overpower? Aren't we not the warriors of truth? Aren't we supposed to destroy the lies of man? Aren't we supposed to be bold for the sake of Christ, taking over things with the power of the Holy Ghost? John 11 verses 9 and 10 say, Jesus answered, are, not, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they, see this by this, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. Like I said, make no mistake, it is good for us to separate our nature from this world, but it's not good, enough, it's not good for us to completely stay in that division and then not interact with them. We're supposed, to, we're supposed to go to the people who are deprived of the light and share them the light of Jesus Christ. And I wonder what would happen if we just took away the judgmental figures of our flesh. I wonder what would happen if we took away us looking at people. Because t- we, we preach about the problems with, our flow, with the flow of our world. We know what's up, right? We know what's wrong with our world today, and we talk about it. But the problem is, is that well, aren't we not those people who are supposed to disrupt the flow? If we took away the gender and sexuality changes that people identify themselves with, what would we find? We would find people searching for an identity, yearning for an identity, looking for an identity, looking for validity, looking for some sort of hope, looking for some sort of value, and this world can't give it to them. What would we find if we, if we saw an addict and we took away the drugs and their vapes? We would find somebody looking for fulfillment in this world and not finding it. What would, we, what would we find if we took porn away from a masturbator? We would find somebody looking for joy, looking for purpose in this world and not finding it. Body of Christ, wake up. The people of this world, the people of this world are not people we should stay away from. There are people seeking the right thing in all the wrong places. They are sheep without a shepherd, broken without God, orphans without a father. And the, the thing is that the devil will allow us to go to church. I'm telling you right now, some, the devil will allow you to go to, to go to church sometimes. He'll allow you to get on this altar. He'll, maybe he'll even allow you to raise your hands, and when it feels appropriate, when it feels comfortable for you, he'll allow you to say you're a Christian. But he'll tell you this, 
the minute that you put a threatening to my kingdom, that's where I'll get you. He'll say you worship in your four padded wall church, but don't you dare speak your Jesus to somebody out there. He'll say you lift up your hands at this altar, but when you get outside of this altar, you should spend time with me in private. We have to understand that we have to be the same people in the trenches that we are at this altar. And I know, I know that I know a lot of times that voice can sink us back. That voice can start to get us a little scared. That voice can start to make us feel uncomfortable. That voice can start to make us not do what God has called us to do. But I'm telling you right now that when you listen to that voice, the only reason that that Satan tries to get you so lost in your past, the only reason that he tries to get you stagnant in where you are is because he's scared of how God's going to use you in the future. He sees that God's already worked a miracle in you. He sees how God's already changed you. He sees how God's going to, how you're going to rob hell of its citizens. But he's scared. He's fearful of you. So what will he do? He put a target on your back. He'll put, he'll, he'll try to scare you away. He'll try to make sure that you can't do that. And then that's, that, that's the point that we have. That's the, the, the deciding point between whether we do what God has called us to do or that we sit down and be quiet. So to encourage you tonight, it's great to say, to go to school, to go to work and say, I'm a child of God. It's great to say, I'm a Christian. But the Bible says that we're supposed to be disciples and make more disciples. Disrupt the flow of this world. Don't stay away from it. We always say the church doors are open. Well, my Bible says that we are the church. The, every single person's heart is the church. So shouldn't our hearts be open to the brokenhearted? Shouldn't our hearts be open to the people who need it? Not to condone sin. Love doesn't condone sin, but love shows the error in sin. Love shows the freedom of the sin. And freedom in, of sin has one name. Not other name, not multiple names. He has one name. That name is Jesus. We have him in our heart. We have him in our minds. We have him in our soul. And we're keeping him away from people. The reason, I was, the reason I felt like I needed to preach about this is because I was at school. I, I, I've started high school recently. I'm in ninth grade. And I, I, I've, I've, I was talking to God, and I was like, Lord, I am completely cool with calling myself Christian. I am completely cool with, you know, going around and saying, hey, I follow Jesus Christ. But, you know, I can't talk to that. I, I don't know. It's, it's weird for me. I can't talk to that person I've never known. I've, I can't talk to this person that I've never even seen before. I mean, God, I, I, I think it's weird. They might find me an outcast. They may see me a little, a little, a little, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, God. I just, I'm, I'm not into that. And then, and then once again, the Holy Spirit always convicted me, but in a good way, of course. I love him. He says, Sam, with everything that is normalized in today's world, my gospel needs a little weird. Sometimes for the sake of spreading the gospel, for sometimes for, sake, for spreading the word of God, we need to be willing to be a little weird. He said that if you're not willing to go out, I want you to preach my word, I want you to preach my truth, but if you're not willing to get out of your comfort zone for it, then you don't understand the value of it. It's life and death. It's not, it, it's not, it, it's not, you can't just, you can't just get a line and say, God, I had all these good deeds. God, I was such a good person. Well, the truth is, is that the requirement of heaven is perfection. And perfection is only given to us by the blood of Christ. And I'm not promising that it's going to be easy. And I'm not promising that, I'm not promising that you're going to have it all together. But I'm promising that this walk is worth it. But when we, when we go on this road and we, when we fight these things, I'm sorry, I know I'm, I'm almost done. But when we, when, we fight these, when we fight this road and when we go on these things, it's important to understand that we're not getting advised by God. And I, I think that's a big thing today. We, we, we allow the voice of God to become advice. It's not advice. God's in control. All right, God's the one in charge. We're the ones in the back seat saying, God, we'll go where you go. And Exodus, the Bible doesn't say that the people of Israel were advised and they were feedbacked by the Lord. It said they were led by the Lord. We got to be led by the Lord. We, do, we, can't just be, we can't just keep him on the sidecar. We got to keep him on the head of us. We got to keep him in the forefront of us. And it's not about, it's not about what, how much light you have. And that's, I'm not attacking the church in any way. The reason that we can open our light up to the church is because Brother Mike's light will share into my light. Sister Rose's light will share into my light. Uh, bro, uh, Carter's light will share into my light. And our light can grow. But we're supposed to take that light and put it out into the world. So it's not about how much little light you have. It's how, how far you'll surrender. How far, how hungry are you? How much do you want God? How much do you want his spirit? How much do you want him to pour into you? 
He'll give you the words. He'll give you the understanding. He'll give you the discernment. But how much do you want it? How bad do you want to share somebody about to the love of God? How bad do you want to share somebody that, hey, I was an addict. Hey, I define myself with this. Hey, I used, to, I used to follow this. I used to worship this. But now I found real fulfillment. How bad do you want to share the word of God? When I first started and when I first got into preaching and when I first got into sharing the word of God, I would shake and I would be so nervous and I would be so confused. But then I realized that it's not about what I can do. It's about what God can do. It's never about us. And it's not about what we can hold. It's about what God can do in us. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm going over time. I apologize. I'll close with this. I ride the bus every morning, if, if you guys didn't know. And uh, the number one thing I do on that bus is look at my phone. I know, Mom and Dad, I know, I know. They're, they're looking at me right now. They're like, mm-hmm. And uh, I got, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm, a, I'm pretty addicted to my phone. And uh, a lot of times on, on the bus, I, um, I, just, I, I just make sure it's, it's, in my, it's in my position. Like, I can always look at it. And what I do is I tuck my knees into the seat. I lock in furl turtle position because a lot of times the bus can get really shaky. And it can get really confusing, and sometimes, and sometimes it can be really hard to hold my phone, you know? So, <laughs> and the funniest thing is that all the, not all the time I actually, you know, keep it within my grasp. Sometimes it falls. Sometimes I'm not able to always have a firm grip on it, you know what I'm saying? But even when it falls, I make every effort to catch it. And I... And this one time, actually, the, the irony of this is that I wrote this part of my, a part of my sermon on my, on, inside the bus on my phone. But as I said, the point. This one time, I dropped my phone, and I caught it with the calves in my legs. And I said, I don't care if I bang my head on the seat forward. I don't care if I have to fall to the left or fall to the right. I, I looked, probably looked constipated. The person across from me was probably like, what is this kid doing? It's stancing. I, don't, like, I, they, I, I didn't know I was constipated either for a while either, but, you know. So uh, I had my phone right here, and I was like, I don't care what happens to me. I'm keeping my phone. It's not going to touch that dirty bus floor. <laughs> and the funniest thing is that that's exactly how we're supposed to be with our spiritual lives. The Holy Spirit is the number one thing in our heart. And I tell you right now, I could bang to my right, I could bang to my left. But as long as I got him, I'm okay. And, that's, and that's, that's the beauty of it, man. If we just keep with the spirit, if we just keep holding on to what we see as life, even no matter how shaky that bus gets, we'll always have it by our side. So my question to you today, friend, do you have it by your side? Do you have it, do you have, are you a partaker in his light? Do you have him today? Have you sought validity in changing your gender or your sex? Have you sought fulfillment in drugs or vapes? Have you sought joy in porn or masturbation? I know that life. I used to live it. You look at me and you think church boy. You think perfect in the stands. You, you think uh, he's got his hair combed, you know. He was raised up in the church. He's got great devoted parents. You're right, I do have, I was raised up in the church, but that didn't stop me from falling. I saw sin, I tasted sin. And all this, on all this time in my life, what this was, was religion to me. That's not what he died for. He died for a relationship. And he died so he could call you his. And it's not your girlfriend. It's not your, and I'm sure he loves, he loves them too. He loves your parents. He loves your kids. He loves your girlfriend or your boyfriend. He loves your friends. But you're here for a reason. You're designated to be here. God called you here because he wants you. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right. He wants you. I know you may have a mess in your life. Right now, I'm a mess right now too, but God made a 14-year-old boy who used to be a lustful masturbator preach in front of you. And if he can do it in me, he can definitely do it in you. I know he can do it in you because what I used to be is not who I'll ever be again. And you can have that same hope in you today. So have you had that fulfillment? Because friend, it takes surrender and it's complete surrender. But I tell you right now that if you take that surrender, you'll never regret it. Thank you. God bless y'all. If we could stand to our feet tonight, church. I'm so grateful for what these young people brought to us. Being real with us. I'll be honest, this generation deals with things that previous generations haven't dealt with. There are struggles on our generation that unfortunately 
the older generation will never have to face. Which is unfortunate because we would like to seek the direction, the guidance from the older generation. How can we, how can we face these problems? And the older generation is saying, do this, do that. Be led of God, seek God. But unfortunately, the older generation hasn't dealt with some of the things that we have. But if our generation can seek God on the things that are, we deal with on a daily basis, and I know Sam hit a great point, and a lot of us don't like to talk about it, but pornography, addiction to electronics, come on, our generation has to learn to seek the face of God to fall on our knees and say, God, we need you. We learned so much from these young people tonight. Hannah taught us about being accountable to God. God, I gotta be accountable to you. Help me to be more like you. Help me to be living in the fruits of the Spirit daily. Caitlin taught us that we will face trials in our life. But through our trials, we have to be thankful to God because he is there for us. And he will give us the guidance we need even if we don't have the answers. Nathaniel taught us that God can do it. No matter what trial we're facing, no matter what our past says about us, no matter what we've done, whether it's you as an older generation who's had failures, either current or way back in your past, or it's our generation who are possibly still struggling with failures, who are still addicted to pornography, who are going through every, every type of problem you can imagine. God can do it. And it doesn't matter what your past is, God will still use you. And God has a purpose for your life. And as Sam, he finished it up, he said, it is our responsibility to get into the trenches and to change this world. It's our responsibility because with God, we can do it. We can do it with God no matter what we've done in our past. If we're accountable to God and we're living righteously, it's our responsibility to change this world around us. I'm going to open this altar up tonight, and if you can just start making your way forward, we're going to have our, our youth choir sing and lead us in worship as we end up the service. But I want you to seek God wherever you are in your walk with God right now. Maybe some of us are still struggling with problems. Maybe some of us are still going through situations where we need to learn to be thankful through the trial. Maybe some of us need to, need to be more accountable and say, God, help me to be accountable for my actions. Help me to be responsible to live a Christian lifestyle that's holy, that's righteous in your eyes. And maybe you're like, God, I'm living righteously. I'm, I'm doing everything I need to. Yes, I have a past, but I know you've delivered it and you've set me free, God. But God, help me to be responsible and change the world around me. God, change this world, God. Help me to be used of you to change this world, God. I'm not perfect, God. And it's okay that I'm not perfect, but you are enough, God. You will always be enough, God, and help me to tell this world that you will always be enough. Hallelujah, Jesus. That's it, church. Just pray and see God. God, help me to be different. Help me to reach a lost soul, God. Help me to use my time.
testimony, God, to reach a lost soul.